Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome again to the Pulmonary and Critical Care Division series on uh, the COVID-19 epidemic and the series of educational uh, lectures that we've been presenting. Um, we're going to have, starting next week, we're going to have some invited speakers as well, speaking on other relevant issues with, uh, regarding COVID, uh, including nephrologists, bioethicists, uh, and uh, hematologists, for instance, looking at other aspects of uh, the problems with COVID-19. Uh, I'm going to give it a few more minutes before we um, begin the, this particular talk. And then uh, I'm going to spend about half an hour talking about the pathogenesis and, and the natural history and how that would help drive decision making regarding therapeutics. Uh, following that, Ibrahim is also going to continue in the same vein, but specifically focus on uh, the cytokine storm and discuss steroids uh, and uh, other therapeutic options in cytokine storm. So I'm going to pause here for about a minute or two, and then uh, we'll, we'll begin in about two minutes or so. Okay, uh, we're gonna start uh, today's educational series. Uh, the idea behind this talk was, as we have started to treat and, and take care of more and more of COVID patients, especially on the floors, we've started to understand the natural course of this disease process. And, and there are phases of illness that we have discovered that helps us, I think, in a way to determine um, the natural uh, course of it, the pathogenesis for those particular stages of illness, and and based on that, potential therapeutic options uh, that may make sense uh, looking at the pathogenic process. So as we all know, um, okay, I'm going to see move the slide forward here. Uh, how does COVID enter the uh, the the target cell and, and especially the lungs that we are interested in. So we know that the spike protein on the surface of the virus binds to the angiotensin converting enzyme receptors. Uh, this is especially true of the upper airway, but it's also true in the gut as well. Uh, the lower airway apparently doesn't have a lot of ACE2 receptors, so that's something to keep in mind. 
But as this spike protein uh, then attaches itself to the ACE2 receptor, it activates uh, serine protease, TMPRSS2, that uh, binds to and cleaves the ACE2 receptor. This allows the spike protein to be activated, allowing entry into the cell of the, a the um, uh, virus, and, the, and then uh, viral replication begins. Um, now, So, so obviously, uh, after exposure to uh, the coronavirus, there is a pre-symptomatic phase followed by the symptomatic phase, uh, which we have, we feel is of a three-pronged uh, uh, manner. One is the viral prodrome that everybody begins with, with a fever and cough. Then we start seeing patients admitted to the hospital who start to become more hypoxic, need more oxygen, and then we see uh, inflammatory phase that is uh, a robust response of the immune system, which may actually be hyperactive resulting in uh, significant uh, issues and intubation and uh, need for mechanical ventilation. Now in the brief symptomatic phase, a question that needs to be answered is how effective is COVID-19 uh, in this pre-symptomatic phase? Because if we were to understand how uh, transmission happens, then one of the therapeutic approaches would be to treat asymptomatic COVID positive people uh, before they can transmit the infection. I think that's a very important uh, public health issue. So I'm gonna use a couple of terms here. Incubation period, I think all of us know what that means. It's the time between infection and onset of symptoms. And then there is something called the serial interval, which is the duration between symptom onset of su successive cases in a transmission chain and the incubation period. So that if uh, you can have multiple scenarios where the first scenario, so you have a primary case, the patient has symptoms, let's say for about a five day duration, they, I'm sorry, are infected for a five day duration and then they begin to have symptoms. That's the incubation period. Um, in the first scenario, the serial interval equals incubation, meaning that the secondary case begins right at the peak or beginning of the symptom onset of the primary case and then begins to have symptoms five days later. The second scenario is where the serial interval is actually more longer than the incubation period, in which case the uh, symptom on uh, the secondary case occurs much after symptom onset of the primary case and then uh, begins to have symptoms. The third scenario is a more scary scenario where the symptom onset of the secondary case, the, the, the uh, infection it actually spreads to the secondary case even before the symptom onset uh, of the primary case. So in this scenario, the serial interval is shorter than the incubation period. So a third scenario is where you have a person who is infected, hasn't started to have his symptoms, but begins to infect other individuals because their serial interval, the serial interval is shorter than the incubation period. So very interesting paper, okay, uh, paper just came out from Nature Medicine looking that, at exactly this issue with COVID-19 about its period of infected, infectiousness. And, and the problem is that the serial um, period is shorter than the, the uh, serial interval is shorter than the duration of uh, the uh, um, uh, of the second phase, which is the incubation period, shows so, so that infectivity begins even before uh, the person begins to have symptoms. Uh, and it seems like a day or so before they actually start to have symptoms. That has huge uh, public health in, uh, implications because we've always thought that the onset of symptoms correlates with infectiousness, but it looks like in this situation, uh, that actually infectiousness begins before even the onset of symptoms. And so uh, looking at, you know, testing a lot of folks and then starting to treat them 
uh, even though they may not be may not be symptomatic, and that's a question as to how to treat them, would be a very important question because that would reduce transmission of the virus itself. Um, they, I know that Dr. Carson is uh, trying to do a randomized controlled trial of hydroxychloroquine with uh, azithromycin versus hydroxychloroquine alone versus placebo in this very uh, group of people who are asymptomatic but who have tested positive. And maybe we may have some answers from that. Now, in the pre-symptomatic phase itself, there can be imaging abnormalities in, these, uh, in people who have tested positive. And there's data out of China that came out of the Renmin Hospital in Wuhan uh, in, uh, between January and February. And they looked at about 58 people who were asymptomatic, who had um, tested positive, but otherwise didn't have any symptoms and their lab studies were normal. And they had pretty significant CT findings. There was ground glass opacities in about uh, almost 100% of them. Uh, some were, mostly were peripheral in distribution and mostly were unilateral uh, in, uh, in those findings. And here's CT imaging from that uh, paper that shows, the red arrow shows you uh, the uh, abnormal CT findings. A ground glass density that exists in the lower lobes, mainly uh, unilateral in, in most of these instances. Uh, then comes the symptomatic phase where you have the viral prodrome and classical symptoms, as we've been told, is anosmia, which indicates that there may be some neural transmission of the virus through the nasal cavity, uh, along with symptoms of sore throat, myalgias, fever, and cough, which is like a classical viral prodrome. Uh, in this phase, the CAT scan changes. You, you see, you can often see uh, normal CTs. Again, this is data from uh, a paper that looked at symptomatic people and the course of illness uh, and uh, the changes over time in CAT scan. And what you'll see is more consolidated fi findings in uh, three to five days after symptom onset and later on the distribution changes to more central and more uh, multiple lobes uh, and, and including starting to see linear opacities which may indicate some fibrotic changes very late. Uh, this is an example of one of our own uh, patients in the hospital who had CT imaging. Um, the, cats, the chest x-ray showed uh, weight densities in the uh, periphery of the lungs. The CT is much more um, uh, revealing of ground glass densities, uh, and this is multilobal in both upper and lower lobes and in both lungs. Um, so what is the immune response that happens in this initial phase? Um, so I'm going to go through a case that was discussed in Nature Medicine recently that, uh, that uh, had lab draws on this patient on temporal, uh, in a temporal manner that revealed the immune response to the COVID-19 uh, infection. This patient had mild symptoms and recovered after 10 days, but it's, uh, it's telling as to how uh, the immune response works and that would help us again determine uh, the subsequent course of a patient who may have not just mild but moderate or severe disease and what's happening to the virus. So this was a 47 year old woman who presented to the ER in Melbourne uh, Australia, she had a four-day symptom of lethargy, sore throat, dry cough, pleuritic chest pain, mild dyspnea, and subjective fevers, the classical prodrome that we talked about. She was a non-smoker. She was not taking any medications. At the time of uh, presentation, she was febrile to 38.5 uh, centigrade. She, had, she was tachycardic, mildly hypertensive, and uh, she was not hypoxic. Her lung exam showed some bronchi. She had testing done, uh, nasopharyngeal swab testing that revealed positivity for the COVID. Um, um, her CRP was 83.2. Uh, this is, uh, so this is in uh, milligrams per liter. So in our lab, it would be 8.3. Uh, the lymphocyte count was pretty normal. Uh, so were the neutrophils. There were no other respiratory pathogens that were detected. She was just given fluids some sub and not even given supplemental oxygen. She wasn't given antibiotic steroids 
or any antiviral agents. At this point, I'm going to stop and, oh, actually the CAT scan, uh, the chest x-ray, and it's, it's a little hazy because it's a blown up uh, image from the paper, but you see on day five, uh, the uh, haziness in the periphery of the lungs uh, on the left image, which clears by day 10. Now, I, I'm going to stop and talk about the immune responses that's expected of uh, a viral pathogen in the human uh, system, so we understand what kind of immune response would be uh, expected in this individual. So you have the infected cell, you have uh, the, uh, uh, the antigen processing cells that then activate the T lymphocytes into either being Th1 or Th2, which then activates B lymphocytes, or the COVID virus can directly activate B lymphocytes to produce uh, antibody uh, response as well as a cytokine response uh, with activation of memory B cells to prevent, you know, uh, cause IgG uh, antibodies and to recognize this antigen in the future. In addition, the cell-mediated immune response from the Th1 produces uh, cytokines like interferon gamma, which are very antiviral in their property, uh, which activates effector T cells and natural killer cells that can then uh, destroy the, in the virus. So in this patient, uh, what they saw was the viral load uh, that at the time of presentation, and the viral load is calculated by the number of cycles that you need to amplify the PCR of the antigen. And so the higher the number of cycles you need, the more amplification you need, meaning the viral load is dropping. So the y-axis shows you a declining number from 30 to 50 of the viral, uh, of, of the uh, cycle number, indicating a drop in viral load. So it begins about, she came four days into her presentation, and by day seven, there is actually no viral load in this person uh, on sequential uh, detection from nasopharyngeal swabs and also from the uh, feces. Um, they also did rectal swabs, and there was also a whole blood sample, and essentially after one week, there was no evidence of any virus in her uh, on this uh, testing. Now, she did develop the, uh, the humoral immune response. So she started to have IgG and IgM antibodies uh, beginning by day one, uh, day seven, sorry, and, and it goes on to build by day 20. They, she had both the IgM and IgG immune responses. Um, now, what was also seen is that she had um, an increase in the number of um, antibody sensing cells, that's the ASC, and that's B cell mediated responses. And for the T cell mediated, that's the program death cells. So there's a linear increase from day seven onwards to day 20. CD4 and CD8 begin to rise, uh, CD8 much more than CD4, which is important because CD8 then becomes the natural killer cells that then is able to destroy the virus by about day eight and nine. And um, also, you see the same natural killer cells start to grow up. This is much higher than a healthy individual as is seen on the right side of this graphic. So clearly you see both a B and T cell response, uh, increase in CD8 uh, response to the virus, and then uh, and the, and the viral load drop off by day seven with the uh, immune response acting appropriately. Now, if you look at the data that they had on 96 subjects who had, um, they had, uh, this is a different, this is the same paper where they looked at 94 people who were infected with this virus and they had sequential throat swabs and looked at what's happening to the viral load on these people. What you start to see, uh, this is a different paper, I'm sorry, the temporal profile paper that showed that it didn't matter if you had mild or severe disease or you went from mild stable to moderate severe or moderate to severe disease, by about 10 to 14 days, you had no viral load um, really in these subjects. And that's important to know. So that the first week is where the viral propagation happens, the immune response kicks in, and then you start to see uh, a drop off completely in the viral load. This is important because 
in my mind, use of antiviral therapy, therefore, would be very important in the first week. And then in the subsequent weeks, it's more important to, dis to determine how can, I, how can you then respond to an immune-mediated response of the system that may be causing more of the issues in these patients. So for the first week, the treatment options would be uh, multifold. The one, you know, obviously antiviral therapy, remdesivir, it's an RNA chain terminator. There's a clinical trial ongoing that's examining uh, whether you can use that as an antiviral therapy in the first week of uh, these patients' illness. Um, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin have been touted as antiviral and they reduce in vitro activity of the virus. A uh, recent RCT of hydro hydroxychloroquine, unfortunately, was not very promising. We have ongoing studies, though, that may give us some more clues. The other thing is neutralizing antibodies from uh, convalescent serum, I think is important because um, they are antibodies, the hum humorally mediated antibodies, that would be important to reduce viral propagation. And so an early use of it is actually more important than trying to think of it as rescue therapy after you know, you've seen these patients deteriorate, go to the ICU. And really, it's not the effect of the virus that's really causing the issues that the patient has. Obviously, there are other uh, thoughts about how you could block the uh, uh, TMPR SS2, uh, or you could block, um, you know, the glycoprotein spikes and so on. So those are other uh, experimental therapies that uh, that potentially could be used in the first week of uh, this disease process. Now. We often don't see them in that first week. We see them during the symptomatic phase where you have the slow smoldering of this disease with silent hypoxia. They're on the floors. They require anywhere from two to 10 liters. They start to require a, a non-rebreather mask. Uh, they don't really feel very short of breath while on oxygen, but then they exert themselves. They get quite tachypnic. Um, they have difficulty mobilizing thick secretions, and this can last uh, for days before progressing. So here's the slow, slow smoldering phase of silent hypoxemia. Uh, this is day two and three. As you can see, the, the infiltrates seem more confluent, but more importantly, they appear to be patchy medial and peribronchial in origin. And that's important uh, with this, uh, with mucus uh, hypersecretion and impaction. Now, uh, this is CT evidence, again, of that sm slow smoldering uh, phase. And if you can look at the CT on the left next beyond the uh, bronchus, and I, yeah, I can move the arrow here, you see this still to this uh, airway, there is peribronchial infiltrates, uh, similarly on, the, on uh, these other cuts. Again, indicating mucus hypersecretion in the peripheral airways, uh, especially probably in the bronchioles. Uh, a lot of incipated mucus that patients have a hard time uh, bringing up. Now, so they have smoldering hypoxia and it's really un uh, important to understand why they're hypoxic in this situation because if we can do things to correct their hypoxia to help them with the hypoxia, uh, potentially we could then uh, prevent a progression of the disease process. Now, I talked about the mucus impaction and the plugging of the small subdivisions of the bronchial tree, and, and that reminded me of asthmatics who have uh, similar findings when they died of status asthmaticus years and years ago. So I have a reference here from 1953 that looked at clinical pathological correlation uh, of asthmatics dying, and, and the description was plugging of the small subdivisions of bronchial trees with mucus. Um, and obviously, it's a different pathology and pathogenesis where there's active bronchoconstriction and airway inflammation. However, what happens is there's narrowing of the airways. So those peripheral airways are minimally, minimally ventilated. Um, and this obstruction leads to areas of low ventilation but persistent perfusion that leads to the hypoxia. This has been um, also shown in asthmatics similarly in uh, a uh, papers in the mid 90s that did uh, mul multiple inert gas techniques to show VQ matching in this uh, situation. 
So it seems that the path that the genesis of hypoxia may be very similar in this uh, group of patients. Now, how could you treat that? Well, that's where uh, we believe potentially bronchodilators may help mucolytics like n acetylcysteine Granted, there is really no data on n acetylcysteine in viral pneumonias, and, the, and therefore there has been a questioning of whether we should even use it. Um, it does act as a mucolytic, but it also has anti-inflammatory properties. Um, and there have been a, a quite a few randomized control trials of high-dose NAC uh, for a short duration of time, especially in COPDs that have shown improvement in inflammatory markers, uh, improvement in the FEV1, improvement in respiratory symptoms, and small airway function, including using impedance the pismography that looks at peripheral airway function. So if we do think there's a peripheral airway dysfunction in these people, there is some reasoning behind why we potentially should be using n acetylcysteine Obviously, this question cannot be answered without a proper randomized controlled trial of high-dose n acetylcysteine in this uh, patient population. So then comes the symptomatic phase, which is the inflammatory phase where you start to require more and more oxygen uh, via either a non-rebreather mask or a high flow nasal cannula, uh, nasal cannula, or you need to intubate the patient to maintain their oxygen saturation. It occurs after about 10 days of the illness. There's an increase in their CRPs and Z dimers, and you start to see bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. Here's an example there where, you know, from day five where you had that uh, colocent infiltrates on the medial side, some lateral uh, densities to much more dense consolidation bilateral, uh, what looks much more like ARDS by day eight. And here's a CT of a patient, I'll try to run this, uh, that uh, begins with mediastinal windows and then we switch to lung windows. And as you see the progression, you see uh, these peripheral ground glass densities, which is classical for the viral pneumonia from COVID, but then becomes a dense consolidation that's bilateral. This patient also had a pneumomediastina. He's still in the hospital. So, so that the immune damage then may become the whole issue in this phase of illness. So remember that after entry and replication and antigen presentation with the cellular immune and humoral immune responses, potentially the cellular immune response then leads to a cytokine storm with activation of multiple cytokines, and, uh, and that may become the major issue in the subsequent damage that is caused to the lung. So in terms of the inflammatory response to the virus, the protective response is the early interferon gamma response, the increase in inflammatory monocyte macrophage and neutrophil infiltration, and there's minimal epithelial or endothelial damage. Uh, with optimal T cell and antibody responses. The problem is that if there is a robust uh, viral replication initially with a huge increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, then you start to see increased vascular leak, endothelial damage, and potentially ARDS. This last cartoon is essentially ARDS itself, where you have uh, the alveolar macrophages being activated, release of number of cytokines. The reason I put this up is the important process of endothelial injury in addition to alveolar epithelial injury and type 2 pneumocyte damage in really causing a release of multiple things, including leading to intravascular coagulation and microthrombus formation. So, um, the increase in D-dimers that we are seeing in these patients potentially could be the consequence of ARDS, but we're seeing it way too early to say that that's what's happening primarily as a cause of the increase in D-dimers, and it may potentially have a very separate mechanism and something to be talked about. But in addition to that early coagulopathy, you could see post-inflammatory coagulopathy because of uh, the damage to the alveolar epithelium and so I'm gonna stop here and uh, we'll take questions after Ibrahim is done when he talks about the cytokine storm. Okay, hello everyone.
Uh, so my name is Ibrahim. I'm one of the uh, pulmonary fellows. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the cytokine storm uh, treatments, specifically steroids. Um, is it indicated, timing, uh, duration, and uh, uh, what COVID did to us fellows as we're getting stronger throughout this uh, pandemic? Uh, so the... Uh, Cytokine storm. Essentially, uh, the objectives of, uh, of this talk is talk about the cytokine storm in COVID. And just a quick reminder to everyone that this phenomenon is not specific to uh, COVID-19. And we actually uh, see it pretty often in the ICU and other viruses. <laughs> talk about steroids, biologic, and um, biologics and renal replacement therapy and its role in the treatment of these patients who are in cytokine storm. So, um, uh, cytokine storm in sepsis, there's multiple uh, studies that showed that uh, patients who were admitted to the medical intensive care unit with uh, a diagnosis of sepsis and septic shock, uh, part of them had a, um, a form of the disease that we're dealing with now, which is uh, cytokine storm uh, or, um, and a subtype that's uh, called HLH in uh, a significant proportion of these patients. Uh, and especially with, uh, with influenza, where that was done on more than meaning the patients who are the sickest, uh, showed uh, a prevalence of 78% of uh, HLH uh, on autopsy for these patients, especially in patients who uh, had H1N1 and H5N1. And it was also a complication arising usually one to two weeks after ICU admission. Uh, so, how does um, a cytokine storm happen uh, with, uh, in patients with COVID? We know that in vitro, uh, there is a delayed release of cytokines and chemokines that is uh, due to the uh, infection with the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, later on, uh, there's a surge in pro-inflammatory cytokines in these patients, uh, such as IL-6, IL-1, TNF, and a number of chemokines. And, um, uh, the interesting thing that I found is that despite similar uh, virus titers in animals uh, who are non-human primates that are old and young, inflammatory response was worse in uh, older non-human primates, meaning that older uh, uh, animals uh, tend to get a worse inflammatory re response uh, to COVID-19. And in uh, mice, uh, depleting the uh, TNF uh, alpha uh, inflama inflammatory cytokine actually uh, protected uh, the mice from the uh, fatal reaction to the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus. So this really highlights that the, um, the role of the inflammation and uh, the role it plays in uh, the morbidity and mortality of these patients. Um, again, uh, as we also know that patients with COVID-19 the worse their disease uh, becomes, uh, the higher, and is associated with a higher pro-inflammatory cytokine levels. So patients who tend to do worse tend to have a higher uh, cytokine or pro-inflammatory cytokine levels, which is also uh, true in patients with sepsis and septic shock due to other uh, viral infections and other bacterial infections. Uh, so when you're gonna be approaching these patients and how you're gonna treat them, uh, there are four really important points. So it's not just choosing the correct medication. It's not about choosing an anti-IL-6, uh, should I give them steroids? It's also important to figure out when you're gonna have to give this medication. Uh, you have to choose the correct patient population. You have to choose the correct dose, the correct duration, and appropriate follow-up. So it's kind of like you, you treating patients with bacteremia and giving them antibiotics. So you have to give the antibiotics early or at an, an appropriate time. You have to choose the right antibiotic for the right patient. You have to choose the right dose, the right duration. You don't stop antibiotics after two days. And you should have an appropriate follow-up. So if your patient is um, having an uptrending procalcitonin or has uh, persistently bacteremic, that means you probably have to change your therapy or increase the dose or change the medication. So it's sort of the same uh, rules that apply uh, in this situation. So the first therapeutic option uh, that we have here and that I'm gonna talk extensively about is steroids. And the reason why I chose steroids is because it's uh, less expensive and um, based on prior data, it worked pretty well uh, for patients who are in a cytokine storm. Uh, so 
as of now, the WHO still recommends against the liberal use of steroids for patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. And um, I believe uh, this week, SCCM uh, published a statement uh, in, regarding, in, in regards to steroids uh, in these patients that I'm going to go to uh, shortly. Uh, the prior evidence uh, for um, uh, or behind using steroids in uh, viral pneumonia is extremely controversial. There's a study that was done in 2006 or that was published in 2006 uh, that included um, patients who were infected with the initial SARS virus that showed improved mortality with patients that received steroids only in the subset of patients uh, that, had, uh, that were admitted to the ICU with a PAO2 FiO2 ratio uh, less than 300. So sicker patients did better uh, when uh, they received steroids. Uh, and the uh, WHO, the, one of the main studies that they quote in regards for them recommending against using steroids is um, one observational study uh, that showed that uh, steroids increase or prolong uh, viral replication uh, in patients with viral pneumonia. So um, this is the study that I mentioned, retrospective 401 patients done in 2006 that showed that there's a better mortality and a shortened hospital stay in patients, in the sickest patients that uh, received steroids for SARS. And they actually had um, uh, similar complications when it comes to uh, bacterial superinfection. Uh, the only significant complication was an elevated glucose level. Uh, so what SCCM, what it, uh, the SCCM take on, uh, on this is that they initially believe that the WHO uh, argument is, first of all, based on one observational study and inconclusive evidence from retrospective observational studies that have their own bias. And um, their take on this is that what is killing patients right now is not the viral load. The majority of the patients that are dying uh, in the intensive care unit uh, are patients who are having uh, a dysre dysregulated systemic inflammation, uh, which is uh, a form of uh, cytokine storm. And this is what's killing patients. Uh, so um, just like Dr. Sundaram showed earlier that the viral load is essentially the same in patients who have mild and severe disease uh, after day seven or day 10 uh, of onset of symptoms. So um, steroids and viral pneumonia. So there's two large studies, uh, one that included 5,300 patients with SARS and another one that included 2,000 patients with H1N1 pneumonia. And uh, both studies essentially showed that steroids were safe and decreased the risk of death by 47% in the uh, SARS population and same thing in patients with uh, H1N1. They were both observational studies. Uh, the uh, current evidence that we have behind using steroids uh, for patients with COVID-19 pneumonia comes from this paper that was published in March uh, 2020. And the interesting thing about this pa uh, paper is that the patients who, re who received steroids, um, they were the patients who were essentially sicker and they had a higher uh, pneumonia severity index score compared to patients who did not receive steroids. So keep that in mind. And then the results showed that uh, the administration of steroids appeared to have reduced the risk of death in patients with ARDS, meaning these patients were to begin with sicker than the patients that did not get steroids, yet they still somehow uh, did um, a little bit better. Uh, and the uh, hazard ratio here was uh, 0.38. So it was a significant reduction in uh, mortality. Again, this was not a randomized controlled trial. It was just an observational uh, retrospective um, uh, trial. Uh, again, this is the graph from that uh, same paper uh, that showed the uh, overall survival probability in the patients who received steroids is higher than the patients that did not receive um, steroids. Um, and then the timing. The timing is probably one of the, mo uh, the most important factor. Uh, so if you want to give steroids to these patients, you, you should probably give it uh, once you have evidence of increased inflammatory host uh, response and an increased inflammatory markers. Uh, the correct day of onset of uh, uh, this specific phenomenon is still controversial, but a uh, majority of experts are recommending this uh, after day seven or after day 10 of onset of symptoms. And uh, sometimes when you take history from the patients, it's uh, really important uh, to uh, clarify that symptom does not mean shortness of breath. It means the initial like, you know, first chills, first fevers, 
anosmia, any type of symptoms that uh, would declare that the patient has uh, COVID-19 uh, pneumonia. Because patients tend to answer this question, oh, I've been short of breath for three days, but probably they've been symptomatic with a viral prodrome uh, five or six or seven days uh, prior to that. Uh, the dose of steroids that was used in, the, um, uh, in that prior uh, JAMA paper was uh, a total of 120 milligram IV daily. It was uh, almost anywhere between one to two milligram of uh, IV steroids uh, per day uh, for these patients. And um, based on what we know from uh, H1N1 data is that patients who went into uh, HLH, and this is only based on case series, they required much higher doses of steroids. Meaning if you're catching the patient pretty late in the disease and the patient has been in cytokine storm for like two or three days and with significantly increased inflammatory markers, then maybe that 120 milligram IV daily might not cut it uh, uh, at that point. Uh, unfortunately, we still don't have um, good RCTs to tell us what is the best dose and if this actually works um, the way we're postulating it does. Um, and then the second question is, what medication do you want to use? Are you, um, if you've been uh, seeing patients for a while who have uh, COVID-19, you would have noticed by now that some of them are getting DEX and some of them are getting uh, solumetrol. Um, the um, answer to this is um, I'm extrapolating from a study that was done in Spain and was published uh, earlier in 2020, uh, which was called the DEXA-ARDS uh, trial. Essentially, they um, gave patients uh, dexamethasone, dexamethasone uh, 20 milligrams IV for five days, followed by 10 milligrams daily for the next five days. Uh, and the steroids were discontinued once the patient got extubated, meaning they got better. And then they found that patients who received um, uh, dex had um, a ventilator free days at uh, 28 days, it was significantly uh, reduced. Uh, and uh, the uh, duration of mechanical ventilation was also significantly uh, reduced and the mortality, again, significantly reduced in patients who received DEX. And the reason why uh, they chose DEX instead of uh, solumedrol in these patients is that in animal models, again, uh, weak um, data, uh, blockade of the mineral corticoid receptors with spironolactone appears beneficial in ARDS. And as we know that DEX does not or have a very weak mineral corticoid uh, action, and uh, that's their uh, reasoning as to why they chose DEX instead of uh, solumedrol in these patients. And um, how about the duration of steroids? So this is um, a, a chart that was uh, provided by Dr. Paul Merrick, and you could probably guess that he's the, uh, he's the person behind it because there's vitamin C. Uh, they're, the, he, they're using in his, at his institution steroids plus vitamin C for these patients, and it showed that if you discontinue the steroids early for these patients, there's usually a rebound uh, reaction and a rebound increase uh, in CRP the next day. Uh, so if you're treating someone with steroids and they're getting better uh, or they're still clinically stable, try not to um, discontinue treatment early for, for example, and we've seen this before done uh, for hyperglycemia or uh, for them to be at risk of going into a DKA, that can be treated. You can do an insulin drip, you can increase your insulin requirements, you can consult endocrine, and um, you'll be able to avoid uh, this uh, rebound uh, hyperinflammation, hyperinflammatory response after you stop the steroids. So the other question that um, we're getting frequently from the um, from the floor teams is that how long you should be uh, using steroids. Again, the Chinese study that uh, was published in JAMA, their protocol was a short duration, five to seven days uh, for these patients. Extrapolating data from other patients who have ARDS from sepsis and uh, other causes, when institutions actually used steroids for them, uh, the use of steroids was actually prolonged. So as you can see in the uh, uh, DEX, uh, DEXA ARDS trial, they used steroids uh, up, on, up until day 10. And um, in um, other protocols, they were using steroids up until day 26 uh, to 28. So for almost a taper over a, over a month. And while we've been noticing that our patients are not really, it's not acute eosinophilic pneumonia, they're not really getting better so quickly with the first dose of steroids, they require, they're requiring a, a prolonged course and a prolonged taper so far. And again, we don't have uh, data from randomized trials uh, for patients with COVID-19, uh, but uh, there is currently, I believe, four randomized trials that are uh, uh, recruiting patients uh, that are looking at steroids versus placebo uh, in these patients with uh, respiratory failure and early steroids.
So we're almost there, so hang in there. Um, from a biologic standpoint, uh, TNF-alpha, so um, TNF blockers, we know that TNF-alpha plays a role uh, in the inflammation for patients with uh, COVID-19 infection. And we know that in mice, if you block the TNF receptors, you uh, provide protection against uh, the morbidity and mortality that's induced by this virus. But just keep in mind that in the later stages of infection, uh, TNF-alpha has not been detected in the serum of patients with SARS. And why this is important, because the majority of patients that are coming into our uh, hospital are coming in usually when they feel really sick. And um, we don't have data showing that they have an increased TNF alpha at that point uh, on the day of admission after seven or 10 days of uh, sickness that's showing that TNF uh, is um, increased in their serum. So um, uh, this is probably why it's gonna be a little bit tricky to use TNF alpha in these patients and you really need to be able to measure that. And by the time the results come back, um, you'll have to give it in a timely fashion. Uh, so this is why it's probably gonna be uh, tough to use uh, TNF blockers uh, for these patients. Uh, IL-6, IL-6 antagonist, um, uh, initial, we usually do an initial dose and there's repeat dosing if inflammatory markers do not improve. Uh, there's uh, usually um, a daily meeting between uh, a multidisciplinary meeting essentially discussing who would benefit from IL-6 uh, antagonist. Uh, the big question here is about timing and cost effectiveness and uh, resource management, uh, meaning uh, it's an um, extremely expensive drug. We don't have uh, a limitless uh, supply of this drug. And um, just uh, I wanted to highlight here that the study uh, and a small study that was done in China that looked at patients who received tocilizumab, the majority of these patients were not intubated and uh, the majority were actually on nasal cannula. So we're giving this medication actually pretty early uh, in the uh, uh, disease course that they would measure the IL-6 or they would look at uh, ferritin, C uh, inflammatory markers, CRP, triglyceride, their age score, and before they decompensate and they end up on a, a ventilator, they were giving them the uh, IL-6 inhibitor. We have done that for a couple of patients here in the ICU, but um, my limited experience have uh, shown that like we're still using it on patients who are, uh, or a significant portion of the patients are patients who are intubated. Oh, we changed that, sorry. Uh, and um, the last thing that I wanted to uh, uh, point out of, uh, from um, a cytokine storm uh, therapy is uh, blood purification treatments. And this was actually used in China. Essentially, what you're doing is that you're putting in a shiley in these patients and uh, you're running the, um, doing either plasma or uh, they're doing um, uh, early renal replacement therapy, uh, not to treat kidney failure, but they're using what we call... Um, um, cytosorb or something similar to cytosorb. It's a membrane that uh, essentially um, uh, takes away all the cytokines from uh, the patient's blood and decreases cytokine levels. This has been tried in patients with sepsis and septic shock, and it actually works in reducing the number of pro-inflammatory cytokine. And uh, one of the um, um, uh, membranes that were suggested to you uh, for us to use are it's called cytosorb and the interesting thing is that when i google cytosorb uh, the company that uh, makes this membrane is uh, right here in new jersey uh, and uh, they've been giving uh, given uh, fda emergency use authorization for patients with covid19 infection uh, so again uh, they're using here cvdh uh, or the machine itself, uh, not to uh, correct renal failure or treat hyperkalemia or treat acidosis, uh, but they're using it to decrease the number of uh, circulating uh, cytokines. I have not seen yet, uh, um, again, um, good data and studies that looked at this, uh, but there are similar studies that um, looked at this mechanism of uh, clearing uh, cytokines in patients with uh, sepsis and uh, gram-negative bacteremia and it showed that it did decrease uh, the uh, number of or the concentration of inflammatory uh, cytokines in these patients. Uh, this is the confusogram, as Dr. Penitari likes to uh, call it, about the, the different uh, pathways and the different medications you can use uh, to treat the uh, cytokine storm and the different interleukin inhibitors. Uh, steroids, um, and there's a lot of um, other uh, options such as stem cell therapy, uh, blood purification. We, uh, we talked about this in order to stop the inflammation and stop this uh, cascade uh, from happening. 
So um, here uh, I had another question while I was presenting, while I was like working on this presentation is that is there a role and how can we actually prevent this from happening? Uh, so right now in Canada, uh, there's a clinical trial that's uh, looking at using colchicine in patients who are not hospitalized, but actually in patients who were just diagnosed with COVID and they're giving it to them while they're at home with uh, essentially before they go into cytokine storm. And uh, what they're doing, they're looking to enroll 6,000 patients. And um, currently, I believe that NYU also joined, uh, joined them uh, to be another site for this study. They're giving colchicine 0.5 milligrams twice daily for these patients uh, in an attempt to um, uh, prevent the cytokine storm from happening. Uh, it's mainly uh, outpatient settings, so patients who are currently hospitalized or immediate consideration for hospitalization, meaning they're about uh, to decompensate, they're not including them. And there's, um, uh, they should have a high risk criteria, meaning either they should be elderly, they have diabetes, CKD, or uh, any uh, risk factor for, uh, for them to, uh, that is known to, uh, uh, to cause an increased risk for decompensation. Uh, and they have, uh, big exclusion criteria, as you can see here, if you have any CKD uh, and uh, if you're hospitalized, if you're in shock, uh, if you're under chemotherapy, undergoing chemotherapy. Uh, so uh, it'll be interesting uh, to see what the results of this uh, study would show. And this is from a prevention before the patient even, you know, comes into the hospital. Um, the last thing I wanted to uh, uh, touch base on is that, as we know, whenever you have a hyperinflammatory response, you are in a uh, you have a, a pro uh, coagulation phenomenon that's uh, that's happening, and um, there are multiple patients who receive this therapy that I'm gonna uh, mention now, and I'm just gonna give a, a quick case about a patient who uh, just got uh, who had who decompensated yesterday. He's a 62 year old male who's currently admitted to the ICU. He had COVID-19 pneumonia. He's on steroids, he's on full anticoagulation. He was admitted to the ICU for respiratory distress. He was intubated. And his uh, ABG post intubation showed a pH of 6.9 and a PCO2 that was above 100 with an end tidal CO2 that was equal to 40, that was anywhere between 30 to 40. At that point, he had no evidence of vent uh, dyssynchrony. He, there was no evidence of autopeep. Lung compliance wasn't that bad, actually. And um, his minute ventilation was pretty high, so he was being adequately ventilated on, uh, uh, on the vent. So based on the above findings, um, uh, we concluded that the patient has a significant uh, dead space ventilation. So in order to explain what uh, dead space ventilation is, I'm gonna show you a very uh, carefully drawn uh, diagram. And I'm really bad at drawing, and my parents used to make fun of me when I was a kid. Uh, so essentially, this is the trachea, this is the carina, it's very realistic as you can see, uh, this is the alveoli, and everything that's in the uh, large airways is considered dead space. That means it is not in contact with the vessel that's here, and there is no gas exchange there. So the CO2 that would be present in this gas here is going to be actually pretty low or lower than the alveolar gas. So D is dead space. Uh, so if the patient gets a clot, and um, let's assume that they clog all, uh, clot all of their vessels, this A here, which is alveoli, is going to become dead space because the air here is not being um, uh, having any exchange with uh, the blood. There is no blood for us to do any gas exchange. So this is how we're postulating that these patients are uh, developing dead space uh, ventilation. So the patient was giving TPA empirically with significant improvement in ventilation. So his ABG went from a PCO2 uh, above 100 uh, to a PCO2 uh, of around uh, 60, and that's uh, after the uh, TPA infusion. So the question here is, is COVID-19 making us do crazy things for ARDS? The answer is no. Um, when I looked at TPA and ARDS, there's um, a couple of studies, but there was one study that was done in the early 2000s in patients who had ARDS that was, um, you know, quote unquote, named end stage. So these patients had um, kidney dysfunction, AKI, uh, they were on pressors, we weren't able to ventilate them or oxygenating them. So these patients were put into two groups, one group that received TPA and another group that did not. And the group that received TPA had a mortality of 70%, while the other, the other group uh, had a mortality of 100%. Uh, so this is something that's been looked at. Uh, 
And there's currently a um, case series of only three or four cases that was published um, uh, recently. All of these cases were in, uh, I believe in New York, but I don't know, I forgot exactly which institution. Uh, all these patients had significant um, dead space ventilation, hypoxemia, and they all received, all four of them received TPA with significant improvement uh, in their gas exchange. Um, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of them had to get redosed with TPA again, which was very similar to what was done in um, the prior study that I mentioned. Uh, almost all patients had to be redosed again with TPA. And we're looking here at doses of 50 milligrams total, 25 push, and then uh, you give the rest over 16 hours or 14 hours. So uh, the take home message from this talk is that appropriate use of steroids timing might improve outcomes in the correct patient population. So if you're using it for patients who are uh, in cytokine storm, you, you should probably use it as early as possible. If used late, based on the data that we know that we have from patients with H1N1 that went into HLH, we might need to use a higher dose. And um, probably if you can use TOSI also as early as, uh, as possible. And you need to keep in mind that you might need to consider a prolonged tape, uh, taper for these, uh, for these patients uh, when they're on steroids. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that CBVHD or other forms of blood purification should be explored as potential therapy uh, because at the moment um, we still have a pretty high mortality for these patients and um, anything that we can do uh, I, I don't think we have much to lose uh, if a patient is going on CBVH uh, to try, I mean, other than obviously resources, uh, see if a clinical trial can be done uh, with the cytosorb, especially that it's here in New Jersey. So uh, getting it up, I don't think it's going to be that difficult. Uh, and there is some evidence to use TPA uh, for patients as, you know, salvage therapy. Uh, for dead space ventilation, and uh, especially if this cannot be explained by, you know, lung mechanics and, uh, you know, vent dyssynchrony or inappropriate ventilation because the patient is um, having, you know, auto peep, you obviously don't want to give TPA for that. Um, and um, don't make fun of your kids' painting skills because it scars them for life. Uh, so, um, uh, the uh, only thing that I would suggest is maybe a multidisciplinary team can look into all these interventions that can be done for cytokine storm, either early, uh, see feasibility, see cost, see uh, RCTs that can be done, or is there a possibility to change uh, local practice and have, you know, critical care physicians, oncologists, rheumatologists, IV physicians, um, nephrologists, you know, all sit at a table or and be a Zoom meeting and to try to figure out uh, what can we do to bring these uh, new therapies or at least do a trial, uh, see what happens because we're still seeing a, a pretty high mortality and the majority of these patients are dying from cytokine storm um, for now. That's at least what we're seeing. Thank you so much. All right, so I think we are open to taking questions for the next few minutes. Um, let me see, there was a lot of chat sessions going on. Uh, I'm gonna try to see how I can get to the chats here. Hey, Doug, this is Rajat, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, so yeah, hey, so um, uh, as you may know, um, uh, I treat a lot of CLL and, and do some studies in uh, CLL and in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And there's been um, some studies started, no data, on uh, using BTK inhibitors uh, in COVID patients early. And so the, the BTK enzyme is downstream of the B-cell receptor and prevents B-cell activation. And there's a I think an international study going on with the drug acalabrutinib, um, and uh, these drugs have been looked at uh, in RA, and apparently um, uh, the group at Ohio State has some data looking at it in some murine models of um, pulmonary inflammation in um, influenza models. And uh, so I wonder if you guys have heard of any studies, and I'll just uh, say that the reason I bring it up today, your talk fascinated me, was because I was reached out by the group from Ohio State for a um, 
uh, BTK inhibitor study in um, COVID patients with a you know, prior history of malignancy? Uh, really good point. I have no idea if we have any RCTs going on right now with that, but it's something that we have a lot of, you know, we've had uh, somebody else talk about IL-7 inhibitors and then, you know, so yeah, attacking, you know, many aspects of this pathway clearly is the way to look at how we can help these people. But uh, I'm not aware of any ongoing RCTs. If somebody else is, they can respond. So uh, not to take a point, obviously there's a myriad, uh, you know, the confusogram or whatever uh, you call the uh, inflammatory pathway uh, slide. There are lots of points of intervention, but uh, certainly mm -hmm. offline if I hear uh, get back from this company a little bit more information for this particular study. I'll just reach out to you, Doug. I know you're, you're busy, but uh, you can, you know, think about happy it. Happy to chat. Yes. Dr. Lou Amorosa, we, yeah. we exchanged emails about angiotensin II about three weeks ago. Yeah. What's going on with the blood pressure as these patients become more hypoxic? Uh, we haven't noticed any significant change in blood pressure. The reason I bring it up, of course, is because in our, you sent me an article about angiotensin II uh, effects in animals creating an ARDS-like picture. And there's been a lot of discussion about angio, you know, the knockout of ACE2 uh, right. by the virus. As it binds, it also turns off ACE2 activity. Right. That this activates angiotensin II and respiratory um, epithelium. And angiotensin II might have some adverse effect on the pulmonary microcirculation. And I think some people are doing studies with ARBs to inhibit the effects of angiotensin II. Any thoughts on this? Uh, no, I think it's a really good thought. I mean, the, the paper I sent you on, on the animal models in ARDS suggested that it's the ACE2 actually that is protective against ARBs in many of the patients. And, whether it works through angiotensin, through upregulation, uh, the inhibition of ACE2 acts through upregulation of angiotensin 2, or is it an independent protective mechanism? Not clear, but yeah, again, you know, mechanistically, there's a number of pathways that can be examined in this, you know, um, in these people. Yeah, and I, I think that the, the unfortunate thing is that it's so rapid, so quick, and uh, <laughs> And uh, such a surge that I have to wait till you know mechanistic studies are done, and then to get to the bottom of it, I don't know how much time we have to do that in the processing. But uh, if we do believe that this is going to be an ongoing issue, which I think is is going to be, then uh, you know, probably worth examining on a long term basis in, in terms of all of these pathways. Thank you. Very informative hour. Thank you to both of you. Sunder, I have a question, it's Susan. Um, about the last statement that Ibrahim made that most of these patients are dying of cytokine storm. I'm actually curious about what it looks like in our institution because um, we're not, it's my impression that we're not seeing people die quickly, most of them. We've had a couple people come into the ER and crash and die, but most of our patients are not actually dying all that quickly and abruptly. So um, what's your sense or what are the data from our own ICUs as to the patients who ultimately have, have passed away? I'm going to leave it to the ICU folks who have been doing ICU for the last two weeks because I've been on the floors to answer that. Steve? Yeah, so I've been, I've, I did, I think like five weeks, about four weeks of ICU so far. And um, what we've been seeing is that the, a big proportion of these patients that are dying they're con consistent, consistently febrile. Uh, they go into some form of cardiogenic shock uh, on multiple pressors or distributive shock uh, on multiple pressors. So this is the majority of the patients that at least I've seen, uh, like I witnessed a cardiac arrest for them. Uh, they, this is um, like, so far I can't remember a patient that we couldn't oxygenate and the PO2 was 40 and that's why they had a PAA arrest. It was mainly these persistent fevers, and then they go into shock. Um, mo most of them, 
uh, and that's my biased opinion, it's, uh, they have a, a very poor EF uh, by the time they're uh, right before they code or the hours before they code. Hi, oh, yeah. this is Sabia. Um, I don't know, the patients that I've seen over the past several weeks, unfortunately, you feel like you get them better. I actually have extubated, you know, several of them, and then they like crash and die. And so my experience actually has been where I think that they're developing like more uh, PE, PE kind of scenario. Um, I've actually, so a couple of people that we've able to rescue, we've given PPA at the site at the time. And I've had like pre echoes and then post echoes like at the time. And these all have large RVs. Um, and they go into RV failure. So I don't know. I mean, I think there's multiple causes at the end of the day. Uh, different people, just like we're saying, different phenotypes of lung disease, also different types of death. Yeah, there's also this, uh, uh, this thought about the uh, late myocarditis and uh, cardiomyopathy and uh, cardiogenic shock. and whether that is myocarditis or whether it's microthromba in the coronary circulation, it's unclear. But we do see some um, EKG changes as well. So there is that as well. But it could also be septic cardiomyopathy, you know, or from the cytokine sword, you know, surge that you're getting stunning, like a Takatsubo's cardiomyopathy. I mean, I've, we, we've seen some of that as well. So there was a question about how do you taper steroids if they're improving significantly? Well, I think you can put them on oral prednisone and send them home on a slow taper if you want to discharge them. So that's one of the questions that wasn't answered, I think. Um, that's again, you know, we do we know for a fact that that's fine to do? No, but <laughs> we are uh, learning a lot from this illness and we are making up a lot of things. Yeah, I think I'm still hesitant to do prolonged steroids on everybody, especially if they've been paralyzed because, you know, yeah. lots of the past ARDS studies that used and the long taper seems like majority dose steroids didn't necessarily show um, a benefit. And if they are paralyzed, you know, you are exponentially increasing the risk of superimposed uh, bacterial pneumonia. And also increasing the risk of critical illness, polymyopathy and neuropathy. Yeah, there's a question about dead space ventilation and whether there's any clear cut contraindication and whether you should be using TPA. I know the instance that, uh, that Ibrahim mentioned was where the airway pressures were not changed. But we are seeing additionally, there are a significant number of patients where airway pressures are very, very high. And one of my patients that I was, when I was in the ICU, did the same thing. Their CO2 shot up, but their airway pressures went up as well. So the lung mechanics changed significantly. So I don't think, uh, you know, we, we, we need to think about the physiology before we act. All right, if there are no more questions, I think uh, we're gonna end this. I think this was a good discussion. Thank you all. Again, like I said, next week on, we may have, we're gonna have uh, outside speakers come in who will interact with the fellows and they'll still work with the fellows to put together a uh, talk. So David Cohen has promised he'll find somebody for me for next week. Uh, and and uh, Ibrahim will speak to the fellows on who, who will work with that person. Thank you all.